The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and we want to continue to explore as Paul explains the relationship that he was able to enjoy with these believers. He uh, explains it in four different ways, and we have uh, seen two of them. Uh, This was a relationship, number one, that was grounded in praise, and uh, number two, it was a relationship that was fortified in adversity. We want to see tonight that it's a relationship that is hindered by Satan, and Lord willing as well, conclude this chapter by seeing uh, this relationship as one that is completed uh, in Christ. I kind of have to say the development of tonight's message was uh, a little bit of a a unique way in a lot of regards, and um, I was waxing eloquent with my wife this morning about uh, how unnecessary this particular surgery is and uh, struggling with all of that and, and thinking, you know, I mean, it's, it's one thing. And most people, at least to me anyway, most people don't go to a doctor unless there's a reason to go to the doctor. And I think there are some who just like to make a weekly appointment to go see the doctor. And uh, I are not one of those individuals. And so I'm waxing very eloquently about how this surgery is unnecessary and so forth. And, and a, a good friend of mine that I've not heard from in uh, several weeks actually sent me this, uh, what I would say is a rather random text of a verse that he read, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. And so I'm going through, you know, thinking just in my own mind how how much I'm battling this reality of, you know, I feel like I've got to go have this surgery. I don't even think I got to go have this surgery. Medically, they say I do, but man, I sure don't feel like I do. So why do I even have to mess? But none of these things move me. And so then I sat down and I began uh, in my study going through this particular message and the Lord led me along these lines of a bend in the road. (laughs) What happens when you are faced with the unexpected? And so I want to look tonight at biblically responding to the unexpected. Notice what Paul says in verse number 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, but once or once and again, but Satan hindered us. Oftentimes, God allows the path of our lives to take unexpected uh, twists and turns. Uh, We all have in our minds certain ideas of how things are going to occur or how problems are going to be resolved. We have in our minds a certain direction that we all anticipate our life to take. There are certain things that, for example, we regard as being normal and typical. For example, children typically bury their parents. People typically live relatively long lives. Employees typically work and plan towards retirement. Most days, the average person wakes up healthy and goes about his daily routine. Most drivers arrive at their destination safely with little thought even given to the what-if scenarios of an accident. These are things we take for granted. These are things that in our own minds are typical and normal. But when those routine things suddenly take an unexpected turn, we find there to be a lot of challenges. A parent, for example, who is faced with the incredibly difficult task of burying a child battles a lot of questions. When someone's life is cut short by our standards, we'll make statements such as, well, that's just not right, or that's not fair, or that's not how it's supposed to work. When a diligent and faithful employee is suddenly terminated, or his retirement is eliminated, we struggle. When the idea of a normal drive becomes a battle for life and death, questions abound. When we plan an efficient day and nothing ever falls into place, we struggle with those things. 
On some of these, they are major levels. Other cases, they're not. But each of the struggles that we are identifying are rooted in the idea and what I would say is often painful reality that things simply did not go as we had planned. In each of the cases that I mentioned, individuals had certain preconceived and in many ways pre-programmed ways of thinking. You anticipated, I would say, most of you arriving at work safely. You anticipated arriving at church safely. Those are the normal things that take place. What is regarded as usual then becomes expected. Not only do I anticipate that I'm going to get to work safely... I go ahead and plan that I am. And my mind is already way beyond actually arriving to work. Many times while I drive to Asheville, I'm thinking about the trip and where we're going and all of those things. In my mind, it's expected that I'm arriving at work. You see? The usual becomes the expected. But I want to ask this question tonight. How do you respond when what was expected is no longer the reality. How do you respond when all of a sudden life takes its unexpected twists and the phrase bends in the road? Well, we know how we are to react. We know that we are to persevere in our walk with the Lord. We know that we are to trust that what He is uh, doing is, is truly best for our lives, but If you are honest with yourself, you'll find that it is most likely a a very difficult process. Most, if not all of us, would testify to that fact that these bends in the road, these unexpected things that God allows into our lives are often very difficult for us to process. We often find ourselves struggling, I think, at these times perhaps more than many other times in our own lives. Before I get into the text in 1 Thessalonians, I want to ask this question, why is it so hard to process these kinds of things? What makes it so difficult? Uh, All of us in here, if I were to ask the question, do you believe that God is in control of your life? The answer to that is yes. Well, then why do we struggle so much? Do you believe that God is good? And the answer to that is likewise going to be yes. Well, so then why do we struggle so much? Why, why is it that these things are, are so difficult to, to, to be able to process? Well, number one, and we've alluded to it already a lot in this terminology, but their nature is unexpected. You never saw it coming. Um, you can plan certain things, but when all of a sudden it's, in many ways, thrust upon you. You didn't plan to go down this road. You didn't plan for this to to take place. It it just happened. Um, And I I struggle, and you perhaps as well, with the unexpected. Um, I can deal with a little bit better bad things when I expect them. It's probably why I've become pessimistic in life. Uh, I just figure, well, if it can go wrong, it's going to go wrong, so that way I can at least anticipate it's going to go wrong so that I'm not too irritated when it does go wrong because that's what's going to happen anyway. So well, that's a pretty negative way of looking at life, and, and it is, uh, but it probably <laughs> saved a whole lot of frustration just because I anticipated, you know what, this simple project is not going to be that simple. And I say all that knowing what's coming on Friday uh, with a surgery. Well, you want to talk about being tempted to change a message. This was one I was very tempted to change and, uh, and just eliminate some of these points. But the, the nature of these things is unexpected. You don't anticipate a call from a highway patrolman who says a loved one's been killed in an accident. You don't expect those things. Okay? You don't expect going to a doctor for a normal routine checkup to come away learning that you've got cancer. Those are unexpected. And part of the reason it's so difficult to process is because the nature of these things is unexpected. 
Number two, they are also unable to be prepared for. They're unanticipated, and so suddenly the person who's faced with them finds himself really with no opportunity to be able to prepare for it. There is no approaching the situation proactively. There is no planning into saying, well, uh, since this is going to happen, and this is probably uh, what would be best. I can go back and use Cecil for an example, assuming he doesn't mind. And if he does, oh well, it's okay. Uh, but Cecil had no idea when he would be up on a scissor lift that he would have a, a, a seizure, correct? If he knew that, would he have ever gotten up on the, on the scissor lift? If he got up that morning and said, you know, I anticipate that today, at, and I don't even know the time, 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to have another seizure. So at 11, at 1058, I'm going to go ahead and extend this scissor lift up as far as I possibly can. It's unanticipated and therefore it's unable to be prepared for. You're suddenly caught in a situation and no longer are you able to be proactive about it. You find yourself now reactive to whatever the situation may be. So we go back and we use a, an illustration, one that we, a highway patrolman calls and says a loved one's been involved in an accident. This time he's not been killed. Suddenly you are now reacting to whatever situation takes place. Well, he's going to need to be in surgery. Well, then surgery is the answer. Was it scheduled? No, it was unprepared for, unable to be prepared for. Number three, they often remove our control. Uh, these, I think we are probably programmed in a lot of ways by the world's system and the world's way of thinking and probably in a lot of ways we don't even realize. There's been a rather popular philosophy that you are in control of your own destiny. Um, to an extent, you're responsible for making certain choices that will no doubt have consequences. Uh, and uh, if you choose to reject Christ, then you are choosing an eternal destiny. Uh, but we're not nearly as in control of things as we want to think we are. And when God allows those unexpected things to take place in our lives, we are all of a sudden confronted with the reality that this is a situation beyond my control. Maybe medical challenges and what we, uh, beyond what we are capable of fixing. It may seem as though life is wildly spinning out of control, but whenever that's going on, always be reminded it's never out of God's control. These are circumstances that are always in God's hands, but when it's taken out from you and you no longer have any control of that, that is a difficult thing to be able to process. Number five, these types of situations often encompass uncertainty. All of a sudden, his plans are irrelevant. <laughs> He's faced with a new direction. Uh, his life has suddenly taken a new course to be plotted out and to be charted. He's entering very unfamiliar territory and he is faced with a great degree of uncertainty. Most people do not like uncertainty, but I do want to challenge you with this thought that it's in the realm of uncertainty that our faith grows. It's really where it always is. When I can handle it, I typically handle it. When I suddenly realize I can't, then I all of a sudden look somewhere else. And sometimes it takes quite a while for me to realize that I can't handle it. And sometimes God keeps knocking several notches down and eventually you land flat on your back and realize, okay, I need help with this. Okay, uh, And those can oftentimes be some uh, very significant challenges. We could look at a lot of different passages. I won't take the time to go through all of those. But one is, I think, particularly important. Paul illustrates how we are to face these types of situations that are really very difficult for us to process. Paul was concluding his second missionary journey and he had determined to take a collection back to uh, the struggling saints who were in Jerusalem. And on the way back, he stopped in the port city of Miletus. 
And it was there that he summoned the elders in the city of Ephesus who were about 30 miles north to come down and meet with him, and they did so. You find the conversation, the discourse taking place in Exodus 20, verse 17, down through verse 38. And what you find is that these believers in Ephesus knew that this would be the last time they would see a one whom they had come to love very dearly. In that passage, Paul began to describe the type of ministry that he had with them. He directed their attention to everything that God had done, and he announced to these elders that he was on his way to Jerusalem, and he was faced with an absolute incredible amount of uncertainty. There was really nothing that was able to be planned about this trip, and there was very little that was certain. This was how he actually phrased it. He said in Exodus, or I'm sorry, in Acts 20, verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. I don't know exactly what to anticipate, says Paul. The only thing that I know is that I am going to be faced with bonds, arrest, and afflictions, persecution. Well, we'll go left instead of that way then. <laughs> Why would you continue to go to Jerusalem? A little bit later on in Acts 21, we'll see a prophet by the name of Agabus who gets Paul's girdle and says, binds his hands and his feet, says, well, whoever owns this girdle, that's what's going to happen to that man. Well, that was Paul. What did Paul still do? He still went on to Jerusalem. This was what he said in Acts 20, verse 24, verse I referenced a little bit earlier on. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, I'm not going to get into the explanation of this entire verse, but it's very clear, I think, from the initial examination of it that Paul refused to allow the uncertainty of the future to adversely affect him in the present. I don't know what's going to take place, this is what I'm going to do. And he determined that he would obey God regardless of what it might cost. I know we talk about things, and we, uh, even one of the points I had was that they encompass uncertainty. But really, how certain can you be of things in life? You, you don't have as much certainty as you think. You think you'll wake up tomorrow morning. You may not. I expect to go to bed tonight. For all we know, the Lord might return tonight. I'd be okay. I'm okay missing bed. <laughs> okay? Rapture's perfectly fine with me tonight. Uh, let them figure out the surgical process on, on Friday because I'm not showing up, you know? <laughs> Go ahead, build the insurance company. I don't care what you do. I'm out of here. I mean, whatever you want to do in that process. We have no idea. And, and what we want to regard as certain in many ways, if we really begin to examine it, is extremely uncertain. We have no idea what these things can take. Aren't you thankful that we serve one who does? We don't have to go through life with all of the questions and uh, worry and anxiety over what may or may not take place. I think we do very well to emulate what Paul said in Acts 20 and verse 24 and when we battle these kinds of bends in the road. Notice here in 1 Thessalonians 2 the reality of hindrances. Paul says in verse 17, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. You know what actually took place? Paul was ministering and ministering very faithfully, and all of a sudden he experienced an unexpected twist and turn. And he uses a term here that's rather unique. It's actually found only here in the New Testament. And the phrase being taken literally means to make an orphan from someone. We're not 
saying this in a physical sense. He's using it in a figurative sense. Spiritually speaking, Paul was their father. And the unsaved Jews forced him to leave Thessalonica. It was as though they were forcing him to leave his own family. We don't know how long the ministry actually took place in Thessalonica. We can conclude from a number of passages that it was seemingly cut short. But we don't know how long that actually took place. The only time reference that we are given is back in chapter 1 that talked about three Sabbath days, suggesting three weeks. But it would seem then that that was when uh, Paul had begun to reap the benefits and had seen some of his converts. I think his ministry continued beyond that. But regardless, all of a sudden, here's Paul whose heart is thrown into all of this and he's suddenly taken away from it. And he says that I was taken away, but it wasn't uh, something that I wanted to have happen. This is something that just was simply done. He he uses this term brethren once again. He he speaks to the love and the relationship that Paul had. Did Paul do something wrong to experience this? No. What's the first thing that most people want to say? Well, what did you do wrong? You maybe didn't do anything wrong. John chapter, I think, 9. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's got to be some wrong here. And that's how people naturally reason. Sometimes God is allowing these things for reasons that are way beyond our understanding and way beyond our control. Paul said, I was forced to leave. It leads us to number two, the response to hindrances. I'm going to say this, number one, maintain the right perspective. (laughs) That's hard. You maintain the right perspective. I've used that term perspective a lot in my ministry here. Uh, How you choose to see things. Be sure that how you choose to see things is accurate and that it is factual. Not emotional, not what you want to see, not fictional, none of that. You be sure that what you see is factual. What did Paul know? Well, Paul knew that this was going to be for a limited time. He says, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. It's for a limited time. Now, what if Paul never saw these believers again on this side of eternity? It still is for a limited time. They were saved. They would be reunited. Now, his anticipation was that he would still see them on this earth. But regardless, they would one day see each other. So it's for a limited time. Number two, it was not Paul's desire. Paul says that I was taken from you in uh, taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. You could not physically see my face, says Paul, but it wasn't because I wanted to depart. And was it a desire that Paul just somehow said, well, you know what, it's, it's too hard here, I'm going to go ahead and leave. Inwardly, Paul did not desire to experience the separation. It was a situation that was forced upon him by outward circumstances. It wasn't what he wanted. I want to hit the pause button here just for a moment. Life often doesn't go the way we want. Right? Now, that was the case with Paul. If Paul had his desire, he would have remained in Thessalonica and he would have continued ministering to them. We could say that that was where his heart was. But God allowed outward circumstances to not enable him to do what he desired to do. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had circumstances that prevent you from being able to do what you want to do? Now, how do we normally respond 
Sometimes we respond frustrated. <laughs> we get very ill with God. We're frustrated that we can't get this done. Sometimes we grow discouraged. But I want you to understand that a mere desire to do something, contrary to a lot of preaching and teaching today, a mere desire to do something is not automatically equivalent to being the Lord's will. Okay? Some things we know are not the Lord's will that we have desires to do. Okay? Somebody does something to us and we desire to do something bad back to them. Oh, that certainly isn't the Lord's will. Okay? They punched us and so we want to punch them back. Oh, this is not God's will. Maybe your desire, but it's not God's will. But let's put this in a, in a righteous perspective, because typically the verse is out of Philippians 2, uh, verse 13, that God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we say, well, God's going to give you the desire to do his will. That is exactly right, but you also have to realize there may be some other factors to this. Let's go and use another biblical example. David desired to build the temple, Correct. Remember? Yes, he did. Thank you. Good. You're still somewhat awake. David desired to build the tabernacle or the temple. Was that God's will? Not for David to build. Now, it was his desire that this take place, but it was not God's will that this temple be built by David. Did David get angry with God for saying no? No. David instead did everything he could to facilitate the building of the temple. He did all of the preparation. He designed the plans. He got the materials together. He got the material list compiled. He gave Solomon the blueprint and the materials and said, all you've got to do, Solomon, is follow this. He didn't conclude, well, fine, God, there's no use in doing anything if you won't let me do this. It was the way that God was directing. When God allows these kinds of detours in our lives, sometimes they are dictated to us by outward circumstances. We have to understand we can't allow these things to frustrate us and discourage us to the point we do nothing. That is not God's intent. God has instead taken and brought certain parameters. And he expects you to function within those parameters. Well, I don't like them. Tough. <laughs> And if you don't like these, what you might find is that they'll get a little bit smaller, okay? And then you'll wish for them to go back. Um, I was driving today. I know this is a, a shock, but one of my uh, daughters, Dad, Dad, can you turn the radio down? I'm tired of listening to this. We always listen to the same CD. I turned the radio up, okay? And suddenly, all of a sudden, she's thankful for the, the level that it was. Dad, stop it, okay? You know, we're going back and forth. Well, you know, sometimes God, I think, that way. Here's the parameters he wants you to function in. And I don't want to do this. Nah, yeah, yeah, right. God says, okay, fine. Squish. <laughs> okay, Lord, can you <laughs> ease that back up? I liked those parameters back there. I'm okay with that. And God sometimes, I think, works that way. We may or may not understand what God's doing, but we have to function within those parameters. So maintain the proper perspective. Understand in this particular situation that this was something that was allowed by God. Ultimately, Satan is the one who hindered it, as we'll see here in just a little bit. But it was still something that was ultimately allowed by God for whatever reason. Number two, not only do we maintain the right perspective, but we also minister where God enables Paul said, okay, so we were taken from you in a short time, or for a short time in presence. We were no longer physically able to be there. It wasn't because we wanted to, but this was the case. So having been taken from you, we could understand it. Paul said, I endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. 
The word suggests not that Paul just wanted to see them really badly. The word suggests that Paul actually resolved to see them. He did everything that he could to try to accomplish this. The word endeavored suggests that he was especially conscientious in discharging an obligation. He took great pains and made every effort to be able to see them with great desire. I phrase again, there's a deep longing that was there. Don't you get the picture by the end of that verse that Paul really wanted to see them? and went to whatever step necessary to see them. He didn't just sit on the sideline and pout because he didn't get his way. He didn't say, okay, well, I can't do that, so therefore I can't do anything. No, that's not what God wants. God may be saying you can't do this, but that doesn't mean you can't do anything. Notice, as he continues on, wherefore... We would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, would have suggests I, I, once again, I resolved to do this more than I wanted to. I resolved on two separate occasions, once and again, to come to you. But Satan hindered them. Satan thwarted it. Paul recognized that the hindrance was one that was caused by Satan, but it was also one that was allowed by God. It is said that Satan is the one who is in opposition. Keep in mind, however, that Satan is incapable of doing anything that God does not allow. Satan is not omnipotent. He is a created being who is limited in his power. All that he does to a believer has to first be allowed by God. Was God opposed to these believer or to these Thessalonian believers growing or other individuals in Thessalonica being saved? Absolutely not, but Satan sure was. Well, why did God allow it? I have no idea. And neither did Paul. Why does God allow a lot of things? Again, I have no idea. These are the bends in the road. Well, they are well known by all of us as believers, and I think all of us have experienced them. How do we respond to these types of things? When God allows these bends in the road, what do we do? Number one, trust that God knows what's best. We often think we have an idea of what we're to do or of how things are supposed to work out. I've got a lot of ideas. (laughs) Those ideas don't work out quite so well, typically. Lots of ideas. I, I My wife anymore just cringes. I've even stopped saying it, really. Honey, I I really think this project should be pretty easy. (laughs) Yeah, I don't even say that anymore. Why? It's not going to be. Say, well, that's pretty negative. Yeah, that's pretty realistic. Okay. Uh, Whatever was supposed to have happened, hmm, just multiply it times four days. uh, And uh, we might be close to being halfway completed. It's not going to be all that easy. Or her favorite is, honey, I don't think this should cost us much. (laughs) Okay, yeah, that's a bad one to make too. So now I say, honey, I expect this project to cost thousands of dollars and take me three years to complete. You okay if I begin it now? Yeah, now that you have a realistic expectation of how long and how much, uh, then we should be fine on this. But often things don't go that way. When our ideas do not match reality, that's when we have to trust God. And that's when we have to rely confidently that he knows what's best. And oftentimes his plan far exceeds our understanding. You know, God's at work trying to do something great. And oftentimes we would be content if only God did something good. But he wants so much more. Rather than fighting against him, trust him. He knows what's best. Number two, avoid unbiblical attitudes. Uh, Don't begin to question God. Don't begin to accuse Him of being unfair or unjust or not good. These kinds of attitudes, if they're allowed to remain, will uh, become allow us to become extremely bitter in what God has allowed. Do that. Number three: prayerfully strive to learn what God is teaching. Understand, God doesn't do random things in your life. God's not in heaven going. I wonder how this would work. I'm going to try this out on Mike. 
Let's see what will happen. Ooh. Mm, didn't think that would happen. Oh, I wonder what this would do if I, if I did this over here. Well, let's try that out on Roy, and let's try this one out on Cecil. We'll just use Morgan and Baptist Church as one big experimental church. Okay? God doesn't do that. He doesn't do things randomly. He doesn't do things without purpose. God's got a reason. I don't always understand it, but I know God has a reason for that. So strive to learn whatever you can with what God's trying to teach you. Number four, faithfully serve in the capacity that God permits. Paul didn't quit serving because he and his men were thrust unexpectedly from Thessalonica. Not only did he resolve to return to Thessalonica, but he continued serving. You know where he went? He went, and we read in Acts, he went down south to Berea. Things didn't work out well there either because the, Thessalon the Jews from Thessalonica found out that he was in Berea, and so they went down there, 50 miles south, and they chased him out of Berea. You know where he went next? Athens. Well, what had happened when he got there? Well, he was supposed to be waiting on everyone else to get there, but while he was sitting there, he saw this uh, inscription to the unknown oh, man. All of a sudden, he found himself ministering in Athens. Paul didn't stop. God allowed these things, but these were redirections for Paul, reasons we don't necessarily understand. So continue to serve God in the capacity which God allows. I want to cover these last two verses. I want to do so very quickly That's because uh, I don't want to have to return to uh, this particular theme. We've seen a number of things about this uh, relationship. We've seen it's grounded in uh, praise, was fortified in adversity, was hindered by Satan, but I want you to see it's going to be completed in Christ. He says in verse 19, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. One of the ways that Paul was able to continue to faithfully minister was by looking beyond the circumstances. <laughs> you know what he did when he did this? All of a sudden, what he saw began to change. He no longer saw, for example, the problems. He saw people. There's a lot of difference there. He no longer saw the hindrances to everything. What he saw was the completion. God's going to take these believers and he's going to glorify them. Everything's going to be finished just as God's always intended. Are these unsaved Jews in Thessalonica going to somehow thwart what God's been doing? No. They're going to be, everything's going to be resolved. So what is our joy? And he asks this question and he answers it. They are ultimately, what's our hope? We typically use this term as a confident expectation. Here it's the basis of this. What's the basis of our hope? What's the basis of our confident expectation? What is the, uh, our joy? What is the person that causes joy? What is our crown of rejoicing, the adornment that results in boasting? Why do we do the things we do? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And the answer to that is yes. These believers will accompany the Lord Jesus Christ and the coming here is the rapture that we'll describe more in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then Paul says these believers are Paul's glory and joy. The word glory suggests they are the honor and the recognition. Remember that it was from them that sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You guys are well known. Your faith speaks volumes about you. You are our glory and you are our joy. You are the ones who bring us joy. And with that, he'll still continue into this relationship, even into chapter 3. But he begins to describe, it reached a point personally, says Paul, when I just couldn't stand it anymore and I needed to know how you guys were doing. And so we sent Timothy back to see uh, how you were doing. And when he got there, we were so relieved to hear that not only was there a church, but there was a church that was thriving even in the midst of a lot of opposition, in the midst of a lot of persecution. And that's where chapter 3 is ultimately going to go. And Paul says, look, Knowing that, 
It's great. Yeah, we stand, we live if ye stand fast in the Lord, he'll say in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, this is, is where we're going with it. What about you when life takes an unexpected twist and an unexpected turn? Yeah, Paul had a proper mindset towards all of this, and I think his mindset serves as quite a challenge for all of us. Let's have a proper mindset when God redirects our paths even though it may be in ways we wish he hadn't, we know God knows what's best. And let's learn and submit to him and see what he's trying to teach us. Lord, we want to thank you for this time. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege of...